like to hear from this panel, because you have expertise in this issue, is you know what are the ingredients that are that are that are missing? I mean, to the extent you read things in the chapter that were working, and I appreciate that. You said in the environmental justice panel, you saw that was you said women, grassroots, and and being willing to to to, to actually stand up to those who are elected officials <coughs> and say no, you got it wrong. I mean, so so that's helpful because you continue in illuminating what you saw that was working, and then what was absent, because I think everyone here has an interest in action and has been you know anxious to hear what what activists. I mean, we, we have. tension in the chapters that I read between individual success versus what we talk about the collective. Because this, some of this animosity that I saw about these young brothers uh, really disturbed me because, you know, we like to think that, you know, as black people, we love our people. And if you have a problem with them, what are you doing to help them? What are you doing to help these foster children? You don't like their pants down? Are you buying them some pants? Otherwise, you know, I know why people don't have certain things, because they don't have it. It's just that simple. These are not little cultural decisions. You know, let's see, I'd rather, I'd rather sell dope. I can't sell the trap and you wouldn't make any money. But I'd rather, you know, sell in the trap or I'd rather be a doctor. Gee, oh, what, does it take an idiot to figure out maybe I'd rather be a doctor? But oh, what, is that an, uh, is that, am I on the pipeline for that? No, I'm on the pipeline to San Quentin. That's the pipeline I'm on. So we have to have a sense of the collective and the collective interests and not our, just our individual interests. And once we begin to get back to that, I think that Danny Bakewell and I, and we are old enough to remember a time when we did have a collective interest, when it didn't go to just what's happening to me and, my, and me. I too can be Oprah. Okay, you can be Oprah. What about the rest of us, okay? Let's talk about what are we going to do for our people and get back to the concept of our people and not be so tied to Massa's house that all we want to do is get a job in Massa's house and close the door to the rest of us, you know? And so I think that one of the things we have to do is have an ideological commitment, not ideological, but a, a commitment of the heart. You know, we used to say that a true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love, that we have to learn to love our people. Now all this hatred about you don't like this little hip hop boy and all that stuff, that's got to go. That's got to go. You need to love that boy and that girl, and you need to say, what can I do to change the condition so that that isn't the condition that will produce this type of behavior that I have so much pro so many problems with? If I could just say one last thing. Here in California, you have uh, the highest uh, incarceration rate. The United States, of course, we know has the highest incarceration rate and the highest number of people in prison in the world, in the world, this country. 50% are black. This came from the Clinton administration that many black people thought was the first black president, making Obama, in fact, the second black president. <laughs> so Clinton gave us the three strikes crime bill, which was initiated here in California, the Pete Wilsons and all of these people, Duke Majors, pushing for this, this over-incarceration. We have double the population in the prisons right now. And we don't, we see these people as what, our enemies? You think some guy who sold a couple of rocks of crack should be in prison for 20 years? We have not, we have forgotten our own people. We have forgotten how to love each other, and we have moved on some private, individualistic, capitalistic agenda that really isn't taking us anywhere because unlike Mr. Bakewell, who happens to own a newspaper, the majority of black people don't own a thing. Almost every single thing I was laughing with him, I said, look at the back of this, his office max. He gave me a sign from office max. So what I'm saying is, <laughs> when people talk about black capitalism, in one of the chapters there was a discussion about, oh, I don't want to talk about black capitalism. Okay, let's talk about collective ownership. Let's talk about, let's go back and look at Marcus Garvey. Let's go back and look uh, at, you know, all the other things that we can look at historically and talk about what are we owning together? What are we controlling? We don't like the images in Hollywood. Where is your film? Where is Denzel White? You like Training Day better? You thought that was a great movie because Denzel Washington was playing a police officer? You thought it was better for Halle Berry to win for that? I mean, let's get real. We don't own Hollywood. So every image that's coming at is because we don't have anything to do with it. And if you want that, you want some image changes? Get your own film distribution. Organize these uh, Denzel Washingtons and tell them, look, do what Steven Spielberg and them did. Collectivize that money and do your own distribution. You're not making any films that are supporting us. Denzel is not making any better films than Ice Cube. You want to dog out Ice Cube, but you love Denzel? So let's talk about what are we doing among ourselves for ourselves. And I think that whether that activism is in 
as economic as you're talking about, whether it is in prison work, whether it is in environmental work, whether, and those, and I, I don't want to say the Sula thing, I don't want to disrespect that because I want to say that the hard work of unionizing is still hard work and I don't want to in any way appear to be disrespecting that work. Get people in unions, get more jobs, do some stuff, but just do something and I think we can do that if we think collectively and not just as our own individual lives, which is what has happened to us and what I'm sensing is happening to us. <laughs> and what I, I would, I'd like to add to that, and that is the... I'd like to add to that uh, the reality that we have to use all of this education and all of these abilities that we have acquired over these last 30 or 40 years to recognize that when white people ask you or say that black people have made so much progress over the last 40 years, the answer to that is yes. In 40 years, I have come from having no job to owning a newspaper. Uh, there are other people, you can find the Denzel Washingtons, you can find the, the, the uh, Oprah Winfrey, you, you can find a lot of individual success. But when you look at the collective movement of black people, you don't find them. The unemployment rate is still as bad, if not worse, than it was 25 years ago, okay? 40 years ago, when the watch revoke took place. Police brutality is down in terms of just the ability for, of them to just uh, malign us at, at every crossing, but it's still happening. It's still happening to us, but we, we don't challenge these things. We watch programs on TV that are demeaning to us and demeaning to our women, setting pot, bad images for our children, and we do nothing about it. We don't even pick up the phone and call. How many of you have a subscription to the Los Angeles Sun? How many of you have a subscription to, to Ebony? How many of you have a subscription to Jet? I know some of you do, but what I'm saying is, how many of you are buying a subscription for the young people who are graduating as a president? How many of you are, how many of us, not you, how many of us are making sure that we are talking to our children about making sure that they go to and they get a black, go to a black dentist? that they hire a black lawyer, that they make sure that, that they are on track, or are we perpetuating this notion of, well, you know, we live in a society where that's race neutral. <laughs> you know? We're the only people in the world talking about race neutral. Everybody else loves themselves, except us. Dogs love dogs, cats love cats. Black people love dogs, black people love cats. But we are always escaping the love for each other. And really, I mean, it, these are simple things, but they're very, very real. You talk about the unions. I was involved in that movement. What you don't know about that movement and what is not written in the book was that we had a meeting with the guy who runs that union and said, we will not help you unless you make a commitment to hire a black person to head that union. Because every person that's heading the union in Los Angeles is Latino. I don't have anything against Latino. I just love black people. And we are absent from the equation. We will not make any progress if we are not part of the progress. It shouldn't make us any less. It shouldn't in, in any, we shouldn't be afraid to make those statements. It's like images. The sister talked about images. You know, it's, I don't have a problem with the images. The problem is we need more, we need a balance. You can, you can look at a, at a sitcom that's not the best portrayal of black people, you just need to have some that are good portrayals of black people. Because we all don't have saggy pants. There are, there are a lot of executives, there are a lot of people who are, just have uh, good, hardworking people. We're going to do an article in the Sentinel this week about a woman and her husband who grew up, she grew up in Compton, and then she raised three sons in Compton. One is the city attorney in Compton, one is a doctor, and one is a, is a financial analyst. It's not just about the, the space that you occupy. It's about the responsibility that we take to do something for ourselves and to do something for our children. Why should we be sitting around asking other people to do for us what we're capable of doing for ourselves? That's what empowerment is. Yeah. Well, well, so I, 
what I'm hearing, and I think it's loud and clear, and then I want to take some questions. Um, and what I'm asking you, uh, I'll get this out and you can re reflect on this as well. Uh, which is, I'm hearing, uh, as far as if I'm asking the ingredients, the ingredients are collective interest, um, and you, you didn't say it again, but I'm going to say this, that I hear um, a message of there needs to be some ideological component to whatever action is. And um, as I was reading these chapters, and I think about, I mean, and it's actually reflecting, because the, the, we haven't talked a lot about it, but the, the message of incarceration rates, the, the impact that has on the black Los Angeles is you know, writ large, that's black America. And, um, and, and it's a different piece and, you know, and, and, you know I, and I'm now an academic, I used to be a civil rights lawyer, so I have to say there's a role I think academics play and I'll, this is not for me, but what is uh, it? Uh, let me tell you. So this is um, uh, you know, a, a, a really dedicated brother who is a, um, a, a law professor who's also started a school, a charter school, he's a great guy, but he just, he just presented a paper where he's lo he was looking into um, incarceration rates and it, actually talking about some of these complicated things about you know blackness but one of the things that his piece reflected so what I'm saying the role that academics play in like the role that lawyers play in movement I mean, we all have a part right in changing things which which is I'm saying something that he illuminated for me that I never would have thought about but he was pointing to the role that um, the, the prison guard unions play in the industrial prison complex and the racial demographics of the prison guard unions California. I'm talking, I mean, this was not like, you know, we're all just going to sing kumbaya. I mean, he forced me to think because I was reading and I was like, oh, no, he's not, you know, it's you. When I hear union, I think white, you know. But he goes on to say, no, 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 this is a union that's a predominantly black, predominantly female, I think, even union. And what, what, what this connects to is your point about collective interest because if you are looking at an individual level, your point about, you know, what are my wages, you know, am I successful? But what you're saying is absent, if we talk about moving action moving forward, you're co if you're thinking as a collective, and if you're thinking that we have an ideology that we all should share, we're not all trying to be in it just for ourselves, I think maybe that's how you know what I need for my family. But if you don't have this collective view of a, a group, and you don't have an ideology, that this ideology of love, this ideology of we help my fellow man, you don't have anything to dictate your actions. So I guess I'm just saying that that's what I'm trying to apply what you're saying to a very hard issue because what I see in Black Los Angeles is a lot of problems. I mean, just an inordinate number of problems and people don't know where to start, where to act. And this is a really important major theme. You're saying act in a different way than the American way, which is act as an individual. You're saying act and think as a collective. And that's very, I mean, frankly radical. I mean, that's just not, it's not very much what we, we There is no progress that we have ever made as a people that we have made individually. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not that complicated. I mean, you just have to look at the reality. I mean, one of the reasons, they had a lot of black people walking around with Tammy's on in the, in the 20s and the 30s. But when Huey and, and Sister and all, when they came together as a collective, as a body and stood in unison, that was a demonstration that these folk are here to be recognized. And that was different. And that is what moved people to have to deal with their own behavior because they knew we were going to deal with them. And if, if you don't, it's just not that complicated. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, I, you know, I, I still don't get the thing about back in the past. I mean, Bill Cosby wants me to believe I didn't see Uptown Saturday Night. <laughs> right, we're going to walk around like a fool now. Exactly. exactly, exactly. So, but another point is, I think, one of the things, working from the, the Tea Party movement to black folks, which seems like a sort of strange connection, right? So 10, 100 reactionary white folks talking nonsense, right? <laughs> On Social Security and Medicare, the crying socialism. They don't want government health care. <laughs> Show up to protest. And they have a 24-hour network that is promoting this very small fringe movement, talking nonsense, conspiracy theory stuff, right? As it, is, it all of a sudden becomes moves from you know fringe ridiculousness to the mainstream. And everybody's the, you know the TV part. I call them the tea baggers. They get upset when I'm on Fox News. Oh, the tea baggers. They're all tea baggers. So the thing is, is that whether it's new media, 
whether it's it's a series of things, we have to get better. I mean, and I think I think that was one of the things that was amazing about 